Well, you grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 1. We're going to Psalm 1 today. It's page 527 in your Bible underneath the seat in front of you. If you needed, needed to borrow the Bible there or on your app, obviously Psalm 1. So, hey, I am fired up, and I hope you're ready to do some serious Bible study today because uh, we're going to dive deep into Psalm 1. It's a short psalm, six verses, but it is loaded. And uh, by the time we're done, I hope it's helpful for you to be able to understand how our world works and how you fit into it. And no matter where you are in the journey with God and Jesus and the Bible, that you would be further down the road and, and you'd understand at least what it means to be a Christian and how you can engage and follow after Jesus faithfully. That's what we're hoping to do by the time we're done this morning. I hope your summer's been off to a good start already. Thank you for, for deciding to make church a priority and coming today. Uh, we had a great time Friday night at the Grill and Chill event. It was a blast. Uh, thank you for all of you that helped serve and chime in and, and be a part of that event. It was really, really fun. I think over 100 people showed up and ate some good food and went through this massive blow-up thing out there in the parking lot. Um, and towards the end of the night, I know some adults were like kicking kids off of it so they could do it. So that was fun to watch. But here we are. We find ourselves in the Psalms this summer. And uh, the Psalms are close to my heart. I love the Psalms. There's something about the Psalms that are raw and they're real. And, uh, you know, you don't need to fake anything when you read the Psalms. You don't need to pretend like you're somebody that you're not. When you read the Psalms, it's like, are you kidding me? That person just wrote that and said that out loud. It's kind of shocking that they would be angry at God. It's kind of shocking maybe that they would be disappointed or they would cry out and say to God, where are you right now? What are you doing? Or I've got enemies pressing in on me. Where are you, God? How come you're not helping me out, God? Or there's other moments where it's a mountaintop experience and it's worship and joy. But man, the Psalms are just like, well, they're kind of like where we are. They're real life, aren't they? And they're just raw and and sit there for us. And it causes us to to invite invite us in to be able to interact with them. And I don't know what your church background is. I don't know what your religious background is. I don't know if you're still exploring who Jesus is and all that. But you might come with some baggage thinking that you can't be real and authentic and transparent because that's not the kind of God. Well, that's not, that's not when I read the Psalms. That's not the case, friends. The Psalms are just right there for us. And it's like, man, are, are you, if you step back and go, I can't believe that's in the Bible. And so we're going to be cruising out of order, hitting some Psalms along the way this summer. Um, but it's going to be a ton of fun. We do me a favor. This might put you out of your comfort zone. That's okay. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, you don't have to. Um, now you're nervous. Uh, but, but would you just take your hands, just take your hands and, and just put them out like this, if you don't mind. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. And I just want you to pray too and agree with me or pray your own prayer out loud, something like this. God, help me to be teachable this morning. Help me to learn from you today. I'm open to whatever you would like to do in my life. Change me today. Help me to be more like you today, Lord. Help me to know you more today, Lord. Help Psalm 1 to get us there. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that it's possible to live the wrong life? It's possible to live the wrong life. And you might, well, that's impossible. It's my life. No, no, no. It's, it's possible for you and I to go down a path that's the wrong life that we're supposed to live. It, it, it's possible. It's possible that the, the world would have you want to do one thing, but God Almighty would actually want you to do something totally different. And it's possible that you end up somewhere down the path of life and you realize this isn't the life I was supposed to be living. This isn't the way it's supposed to turn out. This isn't the way it's supposed to be going, God. And Psalm 1 is so raw and open right out of the gate from the Psalms that it just, it declares what the world is like and it shares with us where do we fit into this world. So I'm going to give you as fast as I can this morning, but it's only one service, so we get all morning, right? So, I mean, six statements about the world we live in and how you interact with it, okay? And you may go, oh, I didn't know that Psalm 1 was about that. Watch this. Watch this. Number one, you live in a moral world. I don't know if you realize it or not, but you live in a moral world. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by moral world? Psalm 1 declares this world has rights and wrongs. This world is not a relativistic world where everybody's opinion, everybody's truth, quote unquote, they throw out there is equal. 
That's not the world according to the Psalms and according to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 would declare that, no, there is a right and a wrong. There, there's a right way to, to think about some things. There's a wrong way to think about some things. I mean, there's a right way to use your brain that God has given you, and there's a wrong way to use your brain that God has given you. There's a right way for a husband to treat a wife, and there's a wrong way for a husband to treat a wife, and vice versa. There's a right way for a child to respond to a parent, and there's a wrong way for a child to respond to a parent. There's a right way for you and I to use our time and our energy and our resources. And there's a wrong way for us to use those things. There's a right way for us to steward those things. There's a right way, a, a right attitude that we can have and a wrong attitude we can have about things. There, there's no place in your life that isn't moral. There's no place in your life that's neutral that's just say, kind of sitting there like, that's not right or wrong, that's kind of gray. And we say those phrases like that, but in reality, no, there is a right way about that and a wrong way about that. We live in this moralistic world that Psalm 1, as I'm going to start to read it, is going to declare to us that, that, that we hang in this world that, that is not neutral, friends. It's moral. And, and God has an opinion about some things. He, he has a right way of us the way we're supposed to go. And there's a wrong way that's opposing to him. That's the world we live in. Do you like the way your life is going? Because if you don't, it's probably because you're going the wrong way. Can I say that out loud? I just did. I mean, I mean there, it's probably because of some choices or some things that you've decided to do or that, that no, no one's twisting your arm, no, no one's forcing you to do anything. We have free will, friends. And it's probably, if you don't like the way it's turning out, it's probably because of the choices that you've made. I'm just shooting you straight this morning. Can I do that? Because Psalm 1 does. Because number two, number two, you live in a world of great influence. You live in a world of great influence. It's, it's probably, there's a magnetic pull sucking you towards something of influence, good or bad, but there's something pulling you. Let's dive in. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is a man whose walk, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And there it is. It just declares we live in a moral world. There, there's a way for somebody to live against the Lord and his law and his word. And there's a way for people to live uh, for that. And, and it, there it is. There's the morality. But there's an influence that's, that's sucking us one way. You live in a world where every single day, in every way, you are being counseled by somebody to do something. Whether it's on the job, whether it's a friendship you have, whether you're in a tough situation and you're seeking counsel from somebody and you're sitting down with coffee over them and they're giving you some wisdom or maybe they're not giving you good advice, you're surrounded by people who are giving you counsel all the time. The person who writes a book has, has a perspective on writing that book that, that they're putting out there. And if you've ever read a book before, they, they are persuaded by something that's trying to persuade you with influence towards what they think about that. The person who writes the newspaper article has a perspective on life. The person who writes the television sitcom has a perspective on life. The person who wrote that song, that musician, those lyrics has a perspective on life. The person who, who is the politician has a perspective on life. I don't need to go into that with you today. I mean, you just know they're, they're coming from an angle on life and there's an influence on you, pressured on you, trying to give you counsel to go a certain direction. So the question is, where are you going to get your counsel from? Who are you going to listen to the most? I mean, that's what, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. We have a choice to make, right? And there's all these influences and all these voices. It's like sitting right before a concert is about to start in 10 minutes. And it's just buzzing. It's loud. The people are talking to one another. And, and the concert hall is full or Red Rocks is full or wherever you're doing the concert. It's just people are talking, talking, talking before the concert starts. It's like that in your world where you're surrounded by all these influences and all these voices. And just go to social media. Oh, my goodness. And just look at the customized ads that are coming your way. I mean, you just have voices and influences that are surrounding you. And the question is, who are you going to listen to? 
Every family member, every friend, every coworker, every neighbor, every stranger in the checkout line waiting at King's Supers is influencing you towards something. And the metaphors that this first verse, I mean, we could just camp here for a while. The metaphors, look at this. Walk and stand and sit. What is he doing? What's the psalmist doing here? It's so interesting because it's like you're walking along with a friend, getting counsel. You're walking around the lake. Pick up a Starbucks down here at Florida and Kipling. You pick up Starbucks, you walk around the, the pond, the lake, and they're giving you influence. You're walking with them. They're giving you counsel. And so you're listening to the counsel. And then before long, you stop and you stand. And you, and you receive the counsel even more because it gets serious. Have you ever had that moment where you're walking with somebody and they say something that stops you in your tracks? That's where we get the phrase from. And you turn at them and go, what? You get, you get the counsel. And then before long, you sit down in the counsel and receive it. So he, the, the psalmist is giving this, this metaphor of these words that are making us settle into this bad counsel that we're receiving. Why do I say bad? Because who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in, in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Don't do that, is what it's saying. But do this instead. Delight in the law of the Lord. But you're getting more and more comfortable settling into this bad advice that you're getting and it's taking you away from God's best for your life. You might find yourself right now with a friend or a family member or somebody that's around you or a coworker or a boss who's trying to influence you to do some things that you just know, you just know, you know that that's not the right thing to do. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't settle into that counsel because if you settle into that counsel, you're going to end up with a life you don't like. And so the question is, are, are you aware that you, you are a person under influence? That you're a person that, that, that have these powerful messages that are coming your way, and if you're not careful, you're going to settle in and, 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 and be comfortable with the wrong set of counsel. Number three, I told you the Psalms are practical. Number three, you live in a world where the behavior of people is rooted in a belief system. You live in a world where the behavior of the people is rooted in a, a belief system, or a bigger word maybe for you is a worldview. Where, where you, you, this, look, look at the Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked and stands in the way of sinners, but, but listen to this, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but is delighted in the law of the Lord. Let me, let me camp down there on the word scoffer for a moment because that's not a passive word. A scoffer is not somebody who sits by neutral. A scoffer is not somebody who's just quiet and ignores that conversation and walks away. A scoffer is somebody who proactively and with passion mocks the law of the Lord. You may have somebody in your life, you may know somebody, you may, you, you may have somebody you've seen on the news or a celebrity out there who, who verbally mocks God and they question God and they, they question what he's all about and they, and they question what, what his law would be up to and what the Bible would say about a certain topic and they sort of, they, they, they're not neutral and passive but, this, but the psalm is saying that, listen, don't, see, don't sit down with scoffers Run away from them. Don't stay close to somebody who's totally bashing God because I love them. And if you know Jesus, you love them. And so it should be offensive to you that they would be saying that about your God. Right? And the psalmist is saying, don't hang out with them. Don't sit down with them. Don't get comfortable with them. But the second question is, what is the heart of a true believer in Jesus then? What does that heart look like? The heart of a true believer is not passive either, friends. It's not this privatized faith that we somehow bought into that's very individualistic in our country where you just, just be quiet about it, just keep it soft, just keep, don't talk much about that with anybody because it's, you know, it's mine. No, 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 no. It was never intended to be that way. Our faith in Jesus is, is, is to delight. There's the word, delight in the law of the Lord. Delight in it. Like you love it. You want to consume it. You can't get enough of it. You got to tell other people about it because it's just overflowing in your life. That's not passive. That's active. And so, so you, you want to get after it. Okay, confession time. I've traveled through Istanbul, Turkey several times. 
coming and going and staying there in that city, as a matter of fact, in other cities around Turkey. And I discovered something along the way, and I first heard the word, but I didn't know what it was, uh, through Chronicles of Narnia. And those books and those movies, and, and all of a sudden I discovered, what is that Turkish delight thing? And what is Edmund being tempted by, the white witch with? I didn't know what that was. Until I got to Istanbul, Turkey, and in the airport, they have like displays of t- Turkish delight everywhere. I'm like, what is that? Is that a meat? What is that? And so, and so I, I, I approached it. I'm tempted by it. I mean, I was like drawn towards the, the Turkish delight, and, and I fell in love with the Turkish delight. My family probably doesn't really like it very much, but the, this gelatin sugar-packed goodie that, that's, that's, that has a, a sugar on top of it, powdered sugar all over it, and these little cubes, and that is what Edmund's eating in the White Witch's thing. And I'm like, no, I, I, let's redeem that. That's not evil. Friends, that's not evil. That's good. Turkish delight's good. Let's take that back. Take that back. And it's really, really, I delight in the delight. I delight in the delight. I mean, that, it, it's that, but it's like that. It's like, I mean, I, do you delight in God's words to you? Or are you, are you, are you repelled from it? Are you, are you pushing back on it? Are you like, no, I don't like what he really thinks about that. And, or or are, are you delighting in his words, in the law of the Lord? And the law of the Lord seems like a weird phrase. It's like, that's kind of crazy. The law of the Lord. Like, I don't like the laws of our land. Kind of, but no, no, no. God has your best interest in mind. So you ought to be delighting in what his best interest in mind is for you. And it's the word of God. It's the Bible for us. Because listen to this. Write this down. Belief leads to behavior every time. You believe something that leads to your behavior every time. You have a worldview, every single one of you. You have a belief system, every single one of you. You have a set of values, every single one of you, whether written down, you've thought about it or not. You do, because your behavior is followed based on what you believe about something. If I believe that God is my best interest in mind, he loves me, he's pursuing me in Jesus, and, and he's given me the Bible, the revealed word of God for me, unbelievable, I have a copy of it, it's crazy, I can read it anytime I want to, and I'm consumed, I delight in that, then, then my behavior is going to change. Because my belief, it's like the way I treat my kids or my wife or my coworkers or, or the church, or it, those decisions are informed by my belief about what God thinks about things. Are you tracking with me? Every single time you behave a certain way, you say a certain thing, you write a certain thing, whatever it is, it's informed based on your worldview. And so our worldview better be as close to the law of the Lord as it possibly can be or we're in trouble. Get sidetracked if it doesn't. Is your delight from the world or from the word? Number four, you live in a world where the behavior of people leads to real consequences today. Man, the Psalms are practical. Look what he says next. The person who delights in the law of the Lord, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. On the other hand, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, God is not mocked. For whoever, whatever a man plants, he will harvest. You reap what you sow, as the saying says. And so let me put it this way. There there is that inescapable seed plant relationship in God's economy. This is not karma. Karma. It's not some kind of weird belief system, some mixture of stuff. No, no, no. This is, man, if you're faithful to the Lord, he's going to bless you. You're going to have joy and peace in your life if you're faithful to the Lord. It's just going to come. There's going to be fruit. There's going to be seed planting that responds. There's going to be fruit that comes from that tree if you stay really close to the stream. So the tree is really smart to, to be planted next to the stream, the living water stream, so that it, it bears fruit. And the leaves come out. And, and in God's economy, that's the way it works. And, you know, we live in a world where our behavior of people leads to real consequences. I mean, if you decide to do one thing, there's going to be consequences for it. If you decide to do one other thing, there's going to be consequences for it. It's critically important for you and I to know that our choices matter today. They do. I have sat with so many married couples before I came to this church and here at this church where it's a miracle they're even in the room together. 
because they're sitting on the couch and they're as far away on the couch as they possibly could be from one another. There's a great divide in the middle of the couch. And once, once they were in love, and, and it's unbelievable, and they, they, they just loved each other at the beginning of this whole relationship, and, and, and they, they think back, and I help them think back to that wedding day and when that whole thing happened, and how did, how'd you fall in love, and how'd you date, and all this, and they fall in love, and then they, and then they find themselves in, in my office, and, and they're, they're against, they're, they're totally, like, how far can I sit away from each other on the couch? Because I'm angry now, and I'm bitter of all the things the other person has done. And then inevitably, the question comes up, how did this happen to us? What a crazy, strange question. Because it's as if the couple thinks that their bad marriage was just them driving their car into a fog that just happened to them. Where did that fog come from? where they don't realize that the answer to that, and with grace and truth and humility, as a pastor, I have to say to them, it's because of all the choices that you've made. You have, you have made your own bed and you're laying in it. Literally. And so, so there it is. The choices that you've made have led you to this place where it's a miracle you're even in the room together. And you're even going to start this conversation of reconciliation together. But the answer to it is that you have put yourself in this position. And that is that, that there is no neutrality, friends. Our relationships are a two-way street. And we decide what we're going to do with those relationships, give and take. And, and are we going to love and deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus in our relationships where we're going to love each other and sacrifice for one another. And it's not a 50-50 deal. It's a 100%, 100% deal in marriage. Because then at the end of the day, it's always 100%, isn't it? It's awesome. It's awesome. And it just means you just need to lay down your life more to serve the other person more. In Psalm 1... It says that the person who delights in the law of the Lord, who finds their joy in the word, who meditates on the, the mind and the heart of God Almighty, will respond to life in different ways, and they will prosper. They will prosper. And if they make choices based on what God thinks about things, no doubt their life is going to reflect that. And they're going to be a magnetic pull to other people around them that want to get close to them and go, man, I want to get to know you more because there's something there. Can't quite put my finger on. And you know what it is. You're living for the Lord. And they don't know yet. It's a magnetic pull. And that's how people come to know Jesus. Because they're drawn to a church and a people who are just trying to pursue the Lord. And we make mistakes. We fall down. Because confession time is, is that I, don't always, I don't always act as if my words and my behavior have consequences. Do you? Every single time? Every word that comes out of your mouth, every act you make, every decision you make, you're thinking in the back of your mind, this has consequences to my relationships and my friends and my job. And, you know, you probably, you probably are like me. You don't always think that way. But man, the psalmist is calling us back to that place where we realize that our decisions and our words, they matter. And they have weight. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up down the wrong path. So will you turn or return to the truths of the Word of God and delight in those? And if you do, there's a promise here. Your life's going to prosper. But if you don't, there's a promise on that end too, friends. It's not going to go well. Number five, you live in a world that's heading towards a destiny. We live in a world that's heading towards a destiny. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You may, why'd you choose this psalm, Jeff? Um, couldn't it be the light and fluffy psalm somewhere down the road in, in the summer? I mean, listen, the psalms are raw. They're real. They're truth. And there's a reality here. We live in a world that has a beginning and an end. We, we live in a world where science cannot pin down the beginning date. Nor can science pin down the ending date. But God Almighty did and can he had a starting date. He knows what it is. Someday in all of eternity, for those of us, we know, gee, when you go to heaven, we're going to know, mate, when, when was that? When was that? Was it just a few thousand years or a million years? I don't know, a billion, billion, trillion, trillion years. I don't know. I don't care. I don't really care, to be honest with you. I don't care. I don't know what that date is. God does. I trust him. 
I don't know what the ending date. The, fu- the son doesn't even know what the ending date. Jesus doesn't even know what the ending date is according to the scriptures. That gives me a headache to think about. How can the Trinity not? No, no, no. I don't know. I don't know. But Jesus doesn't know. He doesn't know when the father's going to say, go and go get him. And he doesn't know. But science can't do that. But God does. He's determined already the start and the finish of the race. And we live in this world where we live believing as followers of Jesus in the Bible and in eternity and that there, there's a moment of judgment that's going to come and, and the Bible's very clear. The Bible even says that, that we're going to have to give account on every idle word. That's incredible. That should just stop you in your tracks. It's a little bit scary. Every single idle word that you've spoken you're going to give an account for? Are you kidding me? I mean, there is an eternity and there is a judgment and, and, and we're, we're free to do whatever we want. And if we, if we live in this worldview where we can do whatever we want, whenever we want it, say whatever we want to anybody we want, write whatever we want, whenever we want, it, it's just open season. It's just an open game then. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean like, you, what do you want then? If it's just open season and there is no law of the Lord and there is no right way of living and there is no right or wrong, we think it's a relativist world we live in, it, then it's just open. It, you can do whatever you want to. So then what do you do? Well, you get as much pleasure as you want. You get as much comfort as you want. You get as much money as you want. Spend as much as you want. Get as much power and control as you possibly can get. This side of whatever's next in that worldview. But it's not that way, friends. It's not that way. There is a here and now. There, there will be a day when we stand before a holy God who is going to judge us based on some things. It's real. And the world says every, everything's okay and, and, and just do whatever you want. Just don't hurt anybody. Maybe, maybe that's the one. But not, 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 every, not every place in the world says that. Even if you hurt somebody, it's okay. That's what the world would say. But no, the psalm says, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Man, that's heavy. Are you keeping in mind that there is an eternity ahead of you? Finally, number six, you live in a world where God of righteousness and love resides. He lives here. He's here right now. This is mind-blowing. You thought the last one was tough? This is unbelievable. He's present right now. There's nothing we can actually do that's going to cause him to be more present here than less present here. We don't get to determine that. He does. He gets to determine how present he is. He gets to determine those things. So we live in this world that, 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 that where he, his righteousness and his love and his truth and his grace is here. Because he's here. He's a person. He's here. He's personal. That's why he sent Jesus to the earth for us. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregations of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking, man, this isn't good, ending on good news, Jeff. This isn't ending on good news. Maybe you say, would say something like this. Well, well, that, that does not seem like good news. But, I mean, that, that's not bringing any comfort to me because if I'm really thinking deeply about this, and I hope you are, you might be thinking to yourself, he knows the way of the righteous. Wait a minute. I'm not righteous. I'm messed up. How, he knows the way of the righteous, and it's the righteous that are going to end up all of our eternity with him? I'm not righteous. I fall short every time. Well, let me remind you, friends, that this psalm was written at a time and period in history where the sacrificial system is alive and well at the temple. This is where, I don't know if you remember this, but this is where they would bring animals of different varieties for different reasons to the temple to be sacrificed for different sins. And it was a gruesome mess every single day. It was horrific. It was a horror movie. With all the blood and everything all spread around, you'd get queasy to see what's going on. But God set this thing up so that, so that we could have atonement for our sins against him. Something needs to take place because we aren't righteous in our own way. I blow it every single day, so I fall short of God's glory every single day. So something needs to happen. When the psalm was written, the sacrificial system was up and going every single day. And there was, there was ritual around all of it that God set up. Do you know why God did all that? Because you might go, man, that's kind of cruel to animals. That's kind of strange. Do you know why God did all that? It was a ginormous historical setup for the cross of Jesus. We needed a perfect lamb to come die in our place on a cross and then rise from the grave. 
And so all that history of the sacrificial system was a ginormous setup for there would be one. And it would be one and done. Where he would come and die on a cross for our play, take our place and defeat sin and death itself. So we didn't have to do that anymore. And so the way we can, we can walk into this is if you know Jesus is your Savior, you are righteous. You're righteous. You're a righteous fox. You're a righteous dude. I mean, you are righteous in his eyes. And so that is, the, I mean, Jesus sent his son, the Savior, the King, the Emmanuel, priest, king, righteous judge, perfect Lamb of God, to live utterly, completely righteous life for us so we don't have to. And that's the good news of this psalm, friends, because this whole psalm points to you need a Savior. You need to delight in the law of the Lord. Psalm 1 cries out that there needs to be a lamb to take our place. Because at the end of Psalm 1, you're going, that is depressing. Unless down the road, there would be one who would take our place. So let me, let me start to wrap it up this way. Why is Psalm 1 so important? Because we, we, we need to, to live with the perspective of the way the world operates and figure out how do we, how do we move and breathe and, and get into that. Has the counsel of other people influenced you more than God? Has every, everywhere around you is influencing you? What are you doing with that influence? Are, are, are there ways in your daily functioning, in your situation, in your relationships at work and at a university or in your friendships or in your marriage, in your neighborhood? Are there ways and choices that you're making that are for God or against God? Because there's a right and wrong. And we desperately ought to figure out what is the right way? What is delighting in the law of the Lord look like? Well, it means you get into the Bible as often as you possibly can. You, you let it marinate in you so you consume it so that it, it just starts coming out of you into your relationships. I don't know if you know the, uh, the formula for distance. Uh, some of you are scientists and mathematicians, you know it. But it's R times T equals D R times T equals D, rate, the rate, the, the speed in which you travel. Isn't this fun? You're learning this this morning? The rate in which you travel times time, how long it took you to get there, equals the distance you're going to go. If you're a runner, you know this stuff. You want to figure this out. How far did I run? How fast did it take me? I want to get faster. If you've traveled on a vacation like we did recently, you want to know how many hours it's going to be before you get home. You just want to know. You, you, you track it. I'm looking at the mileage. I'm looking at the clock. I'm looking at the mileage. I'm looking at the clock. You're trying to figure this thing out. I mean, your, your rate, how fast you're going, times time equals distance. Listen, spiritually speaking, watch this. Watch this. If you miss everything else this morning, please watch this. Your rate is your passion. Times time is your age. Equals maturity or growth. What am I saying? Your rate is the speed that you're traveling as close as you possibly get to Jesus. Are you delighting in the law of the Lord? How much are you delighting in the law of the world? The more, the more you delight in the law of the Lord, law of the, Lord the, the Bible, the more your passion is going to increase. You can't teach passion, friends. You can't teach passion. It's caught. The way it's caught is delighting in the law of the Lord. You have to get in the Bible every single day. You have to. You have to. You wonder why somebody else has so much more passion about the Lord than you do? It's because they're spending more time with him. It's Moses on top of the hill spending time with the Lord and coming down his face glows. It's Joshua spending more time than Moses did in the tent of meeting. Joshua, uh, Moses is done. No, I want more time with God. It goes on and on and on and on and on. It's the disciples spending time with Jesus. It's your passion. Then your age. How long have you been a believer in Jesus? Has it been 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Well, if your passion's high and you've known Jesus for a long time, then you should be the most mature people in the room. You tracking with me? There's on occasion a really per person that's really young in their faith in Jesus and their passion's off the charts and everybody's going, slow down, slow down, slow down. And I'm saying, speed up, speed up, speed up because they're around some bad counsel. And I'm saying, no, keep delighting in the law of the Lord. 
Let your passion go up. Grow in wisdom in your age and, and in your, your experience at how long you've been a Christian. But listen to me, friends. Some of you have been a believer for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and for some reason your passion's low. Why? We need you. I need you in my life. I need older saints. I need older saints who are speaking into my life. And it, and it bothers me that your passion's lower than mine. You are, we ought to have a competition. We're going to see how fast we can go for the Lord. We're going to see how fast we can run. You with me? And some of you, now you're not going to like what I'm saying. You ready? Some of you are thinking about things around this place that don't matter for all of eternity. They don't. And you're, what, you're complaining, you're, you're whatever, and this and that. And, and don't take it personally. Just have your passion increase. And go, okay, how am I going to step up and be a leader around this place? Because my passion is going to increase. My delight in the law of the Lord is going to increase. I've been, an, I've been a believer for 40 years, but I've kind of been stalled out or plateauing. And I want, to, I want my maturity to represent that. And it just burdens me for those that are older than me, who I ought to be going to as mentors, women, women and men, who ought to be knowing the Bible better than me, who ought to be delighting the Lord more than me. Their love ought to be off the charts more than mine. And mine isn't that great. Seriously. I got a long way to go. Their grace ought to be more. Because listen, friends, if we get this right, we're going to have a church that explodes for the glory of God. It is. It is because they're going to go, man, the passion for Jesus is high. The volume's high. Why? Because the passion's high. Heaven's not going to be quiet. It's not. I was looking this week online at all the, all the Red Rocks concerts coming up. You know, there's one every single night. Is, are any of them soft and quiet? No way. Are you kidding me? And they're packed out, every single one of them. And I'm like, why can't we be that way as a church? Why can't we be that way as a church? It's just this huge setup for heaven, really. We're going to be around the throne and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, man, and our passion level is going to be undeterred because sin is gone. I mean, why wouldn't we want to be there? I'm just saddened and shocked by those who, who aren't quite as far along as they could be. But here's what the good news is. Jesus doesn't want to leave any of us there. Jesus wants to move us along. He wants to come alongside of us. He wants us to, we, he, we get help through the Holy Spirit to delight in the law of the Lord. We're not left alone with this thing. It's not you working up the unction. I'm going to delight more. No, no, no. It's, it's surrender, really. It's just surrendering. It's what I had you do at the beginning. Lord, whatever you want to do in my heart today, would you just do it? You tracking with me? You mad at me yet? <laughs> yeah, well, this is hard. And this formula, I look at almost every day. Man, because I never want to slow down with my passion for the Lord. I never want to show down, slow down with truth and grace and the balance. I never want to slow down. The older I get, the more I want it to increase, not decrease. And the best saints I've been around are those that are in their 80s and their 90s, who they don't care about all this other small little stuff down here. They just love Jesus. You just want to be with them because they glow. They glow. They do. So you go spend time with them. It's like, I don't care about all this music stuff and all this stuff, where I sit and I'll angle the chair, whatever. I don't care about that. I love Jesus. And I'm like, I want to spend more time with you because I love Jesus too and you're further along than me, clearly. You tracking with me? I'm going to invite the band to come back up. We're going to get a chance to keep worshiping. Let's pray together. Father, hard for me to even say that stuff out loud because I know how far short I fall. And sometimes I'm so focused on earthly things rather than eternal things. And Lord, there's, there's a city, a big one, sitting right next to us called Denver that has a load of people who are far away from you who don't even have a clue about you, Jesus. Jesus. So what in the world are we doing? What are we talking about here? If you have somebody on your heart right now who doesn't know Jesus, pray for him. 
Pray for them to come to know Jesus. Pray for them to delight in the law of the Lord. Pray for them not to sit down with scoffers. Listen to them. Pray for them to escape that. Be set free from bad counsel to get good counsel. Father, I pray our passion would, for you would increase, that we would love you even more, and it would, it would move out of this service into the streets. It would, it would move into our homes and our relationships and on the job. You help us to love you with all of our hearts, Lord. God, I pray for any barriers that are holding us back as a church from getting there. God, take down the barriers and the walls in our own individual lives as well as the church for us to be able to be everything you want us to be faithfully for you, Lord. Lord, when you're watching and you're wondering how River Church is going to do, you're, you want to prepare your bride for the groom to come back and take us home. And so part of our responsibility is to get ourselves ready. So help us to get ready, Lord, for what you have for us. So we trust you, Lord. I pray, God, you'd move out in our hearts. Help us to respond and and in faithfulness to you. Lord, at the end of the day, help us to delight in the law of the Lord. In Jesus' name.